Um, so just a little background, Pluto is this, for a long time it was this oddball world on the edge of the solar system that didn't really fit with the other planets. It's in this crazy tilted orbit that's not very circular. Um, and uh, in the last few decades, one of the big breakthroughs in planetary science, what I've, it's be, I've been doing it, is that we found this whole other third part of the solar system that Pluto is a member of. And there's thousands of objects out there called the, in a region called the Kuiper Belt. And Pluto is the brightest and the biggest of those objects, but there are hundreds of thousands of others. It's kind of like an enormous asteroid belt, so our asteroid belt is way in here, but uh, this is much, much bigger, and it contains quite a few fairly large objects. So here's Pluto and its big moon Charm that I'll be talking about, but there's this thing Eris, which is a lot further away, but about the same size as Pluto, and then a whole slew of other very interesting worlds, many of which have moons scattered through this whole region. And this is the Earth and... Uh, our moon to scale. So all these objects are a little smaller than our moon, but the largest are comparable to our moon. Um, and this was the best picture of Pluto we had until we sent a spacecraft there, which is why we had to send a spacecraft there. This is a Hubble picture taken in uh, 2000, no, 1994, I think. Um, and that's really as good as it got. You could tell there were bright areas and dark areas, and you couldn't tell much of anything else. Um, but we did know from taking spectra of Pluto, uh, looking at the infrared light that it reflects a lot about what the surface was made of. We knew there was nitrogen, methane, and carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide frost, and then a lot of really dark regions that seemed to be some sort of hydrocarbon gunk. We knew it had an atmosphere um, because when you, we could occasionally arrange to watch Pluto passing in front of a star, and when Pluto passes in front of a star, instead of the light winking out suddenly when it goes behind, it's dims gradually and then comes gradually up on the other side when it comes out and so from that you can learn how big the atmosphere is what its temperature is and all kinds of good stuff before we even went there and even how it's changing so we knew it was about a hundred thousand times thinner than the earth's atmosphere um, and it's mostly nitrogen like the earth's atmosphere is mostly nitrogen but also, again methane and carbon monoxide so the atmosphere is kind of the same composition as the surface and we think the atmosphere is produced by evaporation of the frost um, this is just a pretty artist's impression. Here's what a weather forecast on Pluto might look like. Uh, it's pretty darn cold. Um, <laughs> and the day lasts three days, <coughs> and the night lasts three nights, because it's a six-day rotation period. Um, and we knew it had a big moon. Um, so that's the size of Pluto and its big moon Charon compared to the United States, about half the size of Pluto. And its surface is completely different, we knew from spectra. It was water and ammonia instead of methane and nitrogen and carbon monoxide. Um, we, in the last few years, discovered four small moons as well. So we knew of a total of five moons. And this is a Hubble picture. They were discovered by Hubble, um, showing their locations <coughs> and how, how they're really faint compared to Pluto. Um, we think the big moon Charon and probably the small ones as well were produced by an object impacting Pluto early in its history and knocking off a chunk into orbit around Pluto and we think that's also how our own moon formed. So we, we think it's, we might learn something about how our own planet formed with its moon by looking at Pluto and Charon. It's really the only other example of that in the solar system. Um, so. A mission to Pluto really started right here at 11th and uh, Walnut. This is the office building just downtown where we have our office. And this guy, Alan Stern, founded this office as an external uh, a remote branch of the Southwest Research Institute in 1994 and persuaded a bunch of people, including me, to come and join him there. And he's been the driving force behind getting NASA to support a mission to Pluto. And then he uh, won the... Um, proposal to actually fly that mission and has been running the mission ever since and making the lives of everyone around him very interesting. Um, and uh, so we really owe it all to him. Um, so yeah, there was talk about Pluto missions in the 1990s, but it wasn't until 2001 that NASA eventually funded a mission and we requested proposals which we won the proposal or I was lucky to be on Alan's team that won the proposal. 
Then we launched in January 20, 2006, took a year to get to Jupiter, and then eight and a half more years to get to Pluto, which we got last year. Um, here's our spacecraft. It's not very big. It would comfortably fit in one end of this room. Um, and uh, it's powered by plutonium. This thing at the back here is where the plutonium power source goes and the heat from the plutonium provides the electrical power uh, to it. This is a, the big thing on top, of course, is a communication dish that we use to talk to it <coughs> across all the way across the solar system. Um, we have a bunch of instruments. We have different kinds of cameras. We have ultraviolet spectrometers, infrared spectrometers. We have plasma instruments that measure the solar wind. Uh, we track, we can, using the radio uh, beacon, we can track the distance to the spacecraft to you know, stupidly accurate precision, a few centimeters across the solar system. Um, and we can look at the deflection of that light to measure Pluto's atmosphere. And there's actually an instrument built at the University of Colorado by students um, that measures dust particles that we collide with on our way through the solar system. Um, so here it is. Um, getting ready for launch. Um, this is an electro anti-electrostatic bag that it was in for shipping. Um, here it's been hoisted on top of the third stage that will take it out of Earth orbit. This is all in late 2005. Um, here they're enclosing it in the fairing, the big rock nose cone of the rocket that's going to launch it. You see how small it is compared to the nose cone. It's, so we have a very small spacecraft and a very big rocket that means we can go really fast, which you need to do if you're going to get to Pluto in a can reasonable you think length of time. I'm missing it. Where is it compared to that? So here's the spacecraft here. Oh, I see. And this is the nose cone that extends all the way up here. It's mostly full of empty space. And this is just the top of the rocket, of course. Um, there's Alan Stern actually inside the fairing as they're closing it up, giving his final good wishes to the spacecraft. Um, and here's that nose cone about to be hoisted on top of the big rocket at Cape Canaveral. Um, and this is the little bit of the launch video. I'm sorry, this isn't good quality, but it's still fun. Oops. Let me see. <coughs> so this now is the control at T minus ten. <coughs> Nine, so the spacecraft is eight, just seven, the, well, six, just in that top bit five, there. <laughs> How fast is it going at that point? No, well... It looks slow, I'm just... Right, <laughs> just because it's big. Right, exactly. Um, but it was actually the fastest ever launch from Earth. Um, and we only stopped for about five seconds. It looked really fast. We were, Jane and I, with a bunch of other people, were like 10 miles away, and it was just, boom, <laughs> it was gone. <laughs> Yeah, it was um, so yeah, it was the f because it was a small spacecraft on a big rocket. We no spacecraft had ever launched as fast before. And we it only took us nine hours to pass the moon's orbit. Thirty six thousand. I'm yeah. surprised that wow. you had your own dedicated to this. Um, how do you mean? You, usually, they put all sorts of instruments in one rocket. It it depends. For, for things that are going into Earth orbit, they often do that. Uh, because things are going to similar orbits. Um, but if you're going to Pluto, nobody else is going to Pluto. You can't count them. <laughs> so uh, we, we, uh, we had our own rocket. Um, so we only did Apollo mission like five days to get to the moon. It took about three days. Three yeah. Because they had to slow down and get into orbit when they got there, so they couldn't afford to go this fast. Yeah. Um, but still. Um, and they, it was a massive spacecraft. And we What's the budget for thing. this whole experiment? It's about $700 million, uh, which for an interplanetary spacecraft is actually pretty cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, like the mission that's orbiting Saturn that I work on uh, was more like a $4 billion mission. Uh, so it's very focused, simple, you know, by spacecraft standards, spacecraft. So this was eight... Eight years to get to Pluto. Nine and a half. Nine, oh, nine and a half. Yeah. From Jupiter so, to Pluto. Was eight, oh, from Jupiter yeah. to Pluto. So there was nine and a half years. That's incredible. And where is the capsule now? Well, it's now about uh, 300 million miles beyond Pluto at this point. Oh, so it's still... Yeah, and I'll talk about where it's oh, going okay. next at yeah. the end. Oh, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. 
So we only, uh, after 13 months, we got to Jupiter and we were using Jupiter's gravity to boost us on our way to Pluto. Um, so here's our passage through the, through the Jupiter system, um, outside the orbits of the big moons. And this is an infrared picture of Jupiter that we took. Um, and these are pictures of Jupiter's moon Io, which is incredibly volcanically active, uh, taken by some of our different instruments. So you can see we have a high resolution black and white camera that took this picture. And this is a glow of an erupting volcano, incandescent lava on the night side of that, of Io, and then this huge volcanic plume erupting out of that volcano. And this is a color image where you can see the red glow of the volcano and the blue color of that plume. And this is an infrared picture where you see all the other good volcanoes that are erupting simultaneously, glowing at night um, on the night side of, of Io. So we have these different instruments and they will look at the system in different ways and learn different things from them. What's the material that's being erupted? Um, well, we think it's lava on the surface that's much like lava on the Earth, though very dry, so basalt kind of lavas. Um, but the plumes are maybe a mostly sulfur, sulfur dioxide. I've done some work on that. Um, and so the and Earth volcanoes, of course, put out a lot of sulfur dioxide as well. But it doesn't go 300 miles into space on the Earth like it does on Io. Um, we took the world's first extraterrestrial volcano movie as we went past this. You can see the stuff and blasted up from this canopy falling da back down towards the surface. Um, so we were pleased with that. And then this is just a scenic view of Io and Europa. I'm also now working on a mission to Europa, this moon here, which um, ha we think has an ocean underneath an ice shell on the exterior. And that's possibly a habitat for life underneath the ice. So we're very interested to learn more about that. And then it took us, yeah, eight more years, eight and a half more years to get all the way out to Pluto, which is pretty much in a straight line. So here's Jupiter, and we didn't pass anywhere else on the way, just eight and a half years straight out there. We'd have a party whenever we passed the orbit of one of the other planets. <laughs> or we'd have a cake whenever we, it was an anniversary of the launch. <laughs> but, but a lot of that time we were spending planning what we'd do when we got to Pluto, and a lot of that work was done in our office here in Boulder. Uh, Can I see it, so. so how much work is it to manage the speed so that you end up in the right, obviously the orbit's going, mm -hmm. it's, is, that, is there a lot of, or is we it have so a whole perfect? Team, we is have it? a whole team dedicated to the navigation and um, they're all, all constantly tracking the spacecraft from the antennas on the Earth to figure out exactly where it is and we had a whole team whose job was to figure out exactly, exactly where Pluto was Right. So that we knew where to aim for, and uh, every couple of years they would fire the engines and just give us a little bit of a tweak to correct the orbit and make sure we got there at the right place and at the right time. And yeah, that's a big job. It's a simpler job for our spacecraft because it's traveling in a straight line than for other spacecraft that are doing crazy loops around the inner solar system or around a giant planet or something. But still, it was that's something that requires total focused attention to get that right because nothing else will work if that doesn't work. Um, so here's my our friend uh, Leslie Young help, who led the planning of the encounter using some high-tech tools to <laughs> figure out the kind of scans we'd have to do. Um, and we came up with a whole plan of everything the spacecraft was going to do as it flew past Pluto and it all had to be worked it out in advance. Um, because there's no way to get real-time communication. It's four and a half hours to get a signal to the spacecraft four and a half hours back. And um, so this was the plan or part of it that we came up with. Here is Pluto, here's its moon Charon. The sun is in this direction, so these are the shadows of Pluto and Charon streaming out behind them. Here's our spacecraft careening through the system at 14 kilometers a second. Here in each of these colored bars is the one thing the spacecraft is going to do as it's going through scanning infrared or taking a mosaic of pictures or measuring the solar wind or whatever. Um, and then finally after all that in uh, uh, early 2015 we started getting pictures from the spacecraft and they started showing more detail than we'd seen from the Earth so it was really exciting every week to see more and more uh, detail on Pluto and see features emerging. And then I was very involved in a job to search for any hazardous debris around Pluto. Um, 
we were taking a lot of long exposure pictures from the spacecraft and um, uh, sending them down and analyzing them to see if there were any kind of thing that might we might collide with that might hurt us and here's <clears throat> very heavily processed images that we took these are the the known moons uh, Styx, Nix, Kerberos and Hydra as well as Pluto and Charon we were going to go through the system here we wanted to make sure there was no unknown moons or rings or any debris in that region and here's me and some of my colleagues searching the data really closely and seeing if we could find anything and we we didn't so uh, we finally declared that the, it was going to be safe for the spacecraft and we got to have a celebration after that. Um, and this was about uh, two weeks before we got there. Uh, this is July 3rd actually, so less than two weeks. But we finally declared it safe. Hi. Hello. Um, and by that time, Pluto was looking like this, and you're really starting to see some detail. You still have no idea what it looked like, but this is just so much better than anything we'd ever seen before. And then, this was July 3rd. On July 4th, um, we had a problem. Uh, the spacecraft computer crashed, mm. and the guys in control room were monitoring the signal coming back from the spacecraft, and it just suddenly cut out without warning. And uh, didn't just call Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> well, we called in all the software experts and they figured out what was wrong and it but it took them like three days to fix it. And this is just I wasn't part of the fixing, I was just listening in on teleconferences and this is just me listening in on the teleconference. They're going through the checklist of all the things they have to do to fix the spacecraft, make sure they don't do anything to make it worse and all this Apollo thirteen stuff. It was really cool. Um, and so this is a couple of days later, this is Mission Operations Manager Alice Bowman who's looking very tired but very happy because she got very little sleep the last few days but had, they'd fixed the problem, the spacecraft was on the mend and would be resuming normal operations just a week before we got there. Um, and uh, so we, th then the science team people arrived and we had a party, this is... Uh, um, Alan Stern again and the mission manager Glenn Fountain celebrating our, the fact we were almost there after nine and a half years. Um, uh, Wisconsin cheesecake, uh, cheese head hats work really well to make spacecraft models. <laughs> um, so then a week before we were back in business we were getting pictures again and we saw this picture that showed this beautiful heart shaped feature on Pluto which we thought was a good sign. Um, and three days out it looked like this, looking at the opposite side. Two days out it looked like this, now we're really starting to see fine detail, but we still had no idea what any of it meant. So we thought at this point maybe this was a crater here. Um, and then the last picture we got before we got there, which was came in just 12 hours before we arrived, um, came in about midnight and Five of us were up all night getting that image ready for public release the next day. It was by far the best pictures that had been taken at that point, so we felt very privileged to be there. Here we are working on the, this thing at, late at night. Um, that's, and this is what that image looked like when we first saw it. Now you're starting to see things like craters and hints of mountains and things. So we sharpened up the image by about 1.30 a.m. and we added color about 3.30 a.m. <laughs> And we got about an hour's sleep, I went back to the hotel, showed Jane the picture and grabbed an hour's sleep before we had to get ready to go back in. But by 8am this picture was released and was uh, uh, just went viral all over the internet and Obama retweeted it later in the day and so on. It was just amazing because this was by far the best picture of Pluto we'd ever seen. This is a spacecraft doing its thing during the encounter. Um, obviously just a computer simulation, but you see it's scanning across the different objects as we approach the system, uh, looking at each of the moons in turn, um, making mosaics of Pluto. Um, we're coming up to closest approach. Near closest approach, we pass through the plane that all the moons are orbiting in. You'll see that in a minute, and that's when we get our highest resolution pictures. So that's happening about, about now. And then we pass behind and we pass through the shadow of Pluto. So you see Pluto passing in front of the sun there. 
and that's when we watch the sunlight passing through the atmosphere and learn about the atmosphere of Pluto. And so was the computer pre-programmed to do all of that since there's four oh, yeah. and a half hours? So you just knew that it, when it got to a certain level, it needs to start. Um, right, yeah, it's, everything was timed. We even rehearsed the whole thing on the spacecraft two years out earlier. So the spacecraft did all those maneuvers and all those scans and took all those pictures of nothing uh, just to make sure we knew it would all work smoothly on the day. Because right. um, there was just no margin for error. We had one, we were traveling 14 kilometers a second. There was no way to slow down. There was no way to go back if we got it wrong. So everything had to work perfectly. Um, so that was Encounter Day, and we didn't hear much from the spacecraft on Encounter Day because it was so busy, except at the end of the day, it called back and told us it was okay, and that made us all very happy. Um, but the next day, it started sending pictures back. So here we are, gathered around my computer, um, getting our first glimpse of what Pluto looked like close up. Um, this was an amazing moment. Because that picture from the other day that we sent around the world it looked like that, but this picture was just a close-up of what's in that little red box. And it looked like this. And so suddenly we're seeing Pluto as a real world, with mountains and plains. And um, you could see just from this one picture that it was an incredibly varied and interesting place. These mountains are about the size of the Rocky Mountains, um, and about as high as the Rocky Mountains. Um, and this picture has no craters on it, which is very exciting because. Surfaces like the moon are covered in craters because the moon is very old and it gets hammered by interplanetary debris, comets and asteroids. And um, because there's no geological activity, those craters just survive. The Earth is getting hammered by interplanetary debris the same way, but because the Earth is geologically active, it buries and covers up and destroys those craters as they come along. And this shows you Pluto's doing that too. So it has um, these mountains and these plains and all these other weird stuff must be fairly young in order to um, not have been covered in craters. And so we knew that we had a very interesting world just from this one picture. And then we just kept getting pictures back, uh, more and more detail, um, and it actually, we got our last pictures back from the spacecraft last week. It took us over a year to get everything down. Um, but so Roger tells us that the Earth is 4.2 billion years and the Moon separated 500 million after, so we have some mm -hmm. range of age. Do we have a range uh, of age? For well, we're pretty sure that Pluto formed the same time as the rest of the solar system, so that was 4.5 billion years ago, the same time as the Earth and the Moon. Um, but we don't... Uh, Beyond that, to know, look, when did this particular crater or mountain or whatever oh, form? No, 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 no. The only way we can do that is we can calculate how rapidly things should be hitting Pluto and then count the number of craters and see if we can estimate from the number of craters that have accumulated how long that must have taken. And we can do that, but not better than a factor of two or so. Um, John, isn't it kind of out of place being a rocky planet way out there? And well, it's not. It's actually, its composition is fairly typical for things out there. It's about half rock and half ice. And the rock is all sunk to the middle. So what we're seeing is all ice. So these mountains are all made of ordinary water ice. Um, just, you know, like you'd find in your refrigerator. Um, but it's so cold and hard on Pluto that it acts like a rock and makes topography like that. Yeah. So I read that uh, the prevailing theory about all the water on the planet Earth is that it came from uh, comets. Um, um, yeah, that's a really hot topic people are trying to understand. Is that, would that by corollary also mean that this, all this water may have come from comets? Well, not it's more that comets came from this part of the solar system. So when the solar system formed, it was pretty warm near the sun and ice did not freeze out. But in the outer solar system where Pluto is and even where Jupiter and Saturn are, it was cold enough that ice froze. And so a lot of ice got incorporated into those bodies and ice is really actually very common. So the, the comets are a way that you can get ice from the outer solar system back into the inner solar system to make our oceans and so on. Uh, but there's a lot of ice out there. 
And there's also a lot of controversy as to whether it was comets or asteroids or what that brought the water to Earth. The current idea is it probably wasn't comets, actually. Um, but, the, but the general picture that there's a lot of water and ice frozen in the outer solar system, and you have to find a way to get some of that back into the Earth where it wouldn't have fought, been in the first place. So what's the is, common idea now? Uh, well, um, the best I've heard is there are asteroids um, that are more distant from the Sun that are far enough from the sun that they have quite a lot of water in them. And so it may have been some of that stuff that those asteroids are made out of that got perturbed into the Earth and gave us our water, um, though we don't really know yet. But that's kind of what seems to be the most consistent with the evidence. What is the difference between an asteroid and a comet? Oh, um, asteroids are in stable orbits between the Mar Mars and Jupiter. Um, and they've been there for four billion years. Whereas comets, um, and they're mostly rocky, but the ones furthest from the sun we think have some water in them. Whereas comets formed much, much further from the sun, they have more water in them than, than asteroids. Um, and they've got, had a much more complicated history. Some of them got shoved way out, way out beyond the planets, and then maybe got perturbed by stars back in towards the sun. And so they're, they're constantly coming and going in unpredictable ways, whereas the asteroids are kind of just going around the sun all the time in pretty predictable ways. So if asteroids delivered the water, mm -hmm. then and they came from the asteroid belt? Uh, probably. So we think there's a lot more water in the asteroid belt. Than yeah, that's a fairly new idea. We're, we're finding evidence that there is a lot more water in the asteroid belt than we originally thought. Yeah. So Pluto is more from the realm of the comets, um, but he's much bigger than any comet. So this is our best color picture, and it's really, this picture is like, 6,000 pixels across and you have to get it off the internet and scroll around to see all the fabulous stuff in it. But I'm going to show you a zoom of pictures across this strip here to show you some idea of how um, much variety there is on Pluto and the quality of the pictures. So here we are looking out to the skyline. Um, this area is old, it's covered in craters, but there's, you see geological faults cutting across the craters. Um, then really as you go further south it just gets stranger and stranger. Um, we have planes here, we have very complicated light and dark patterns which we were expecting to see. The craters getting more and more broken up and buried and destroyed. And then down here you're getting into bright smooth areas that have no craters at all and are very young. And right next to areas that are incredibly old and beaten up. And so incredible contrast. And then here's back to that region we saw in that first picture where you see those mountains <coughs> and the smooth plains and other weird stuff near the uh, edge of the night. And this is another... You're saying what we were looking at is all ice? Uh, yes. <coughs> uh, kind of bedrock of water mm -hmm. ice and then nitrogen and methane and carbon monoxide ice is all smeared over the surface and mostly covering up the water ice. But yeah, it looks like a terrestrial landscape in some areas because that ice is so hard. Um, this is another movie, because I really like these movies, that is now our highest, our most detailed pictures that we took, the highest resolution pictures, and it's going to be a strip just across here. And it's a similar story that the northern regions are very bright and have craters on them. It's like a snow-covered landscape, and it probably is snow-covered, though the snow is methane. And then as you get further south, this gets broken up and eroded. And we have this jumbled region of mountains. Um, and then suddenly you reach the edge of the mountains. It's a lot like Boulder, in fact, mm. where there's a sudden edge of the mountains. You're out in this vast plain, and you see the plain is made of these weird blobby regions that we think are convection cells. We think this is nitrogen that is convecting and bubbling like water on a stove. So. Wow. Totally weird landscapes. So that's our global view of Pluto because it was rotating as we approached. We could take pictures of all sides, but part of it was in darkness the whole time. It was winter there, so we, we don't know what's actually down here. Um, but looking at this color picture again, we can zoom in. This is a region that we think is particularly interesting. Um, we've got informal names and we're negotiating with the International Astronomical Union about getting these names formalized. But for now, we're doing quotes. 
And this is the most interesting region on Pluto um, that we've seen. Uh, we can measure the composition because of our infrared instruments, and it's got nitrogen, methane, carbon monoxide. Um, and this is a bit of a zoom in. And if you look near the edge of this region up here, you can see this, it's covered in this pasty fluid stuff, which we think is frozen nitrogen, kilometers thickness of frozen nitrogen. Um, and it's flowing around mountains here like a glacier. It's acting a lot like a glacier. And then there's all these weird blobby things, which we think are, again, convection, where material is welling up and cooling and sinking down again. The landscape here is very heavily eroded by glaciers, maybe. We have these huge mountain ranges that are just jumbled up log jams of mountains um, that have somehow broken off. And maybe we maybe have mountain-sized icebergs floating in, liquid, in solid nitrogen. Mm -hmm. That's the best idea we have for what's going on here. This is a close-up region there. Um, John, these yep. mountains are as high as the Rockies. Yeah, right. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is uh, one of the highest ones. It's maybe the height of Hikes, Pikes Peak here above the surrounding plains. And yeah, this is that boulder-like area. This is a region, if this was Denver was here, boulder would be about over there. That's the kind of scale of things that we're seeing. Um, where this, <coughs> these jumbled mountains just suddenly break onto this plain of frozen nitrogen. Uh, we see glaciers pouring down off the highlands into this region, and we think the glaciers are made of so, uh, solid nitrogen that flows down, it's, but they look a lot like glaciers on Earth. You see streamlines in them. Um, we have totally bizarre things like this. We think it may be an ice volcano of some kind. Um, and stuff we're calling bladed terrain, but we really have no idea what it is here. Um, uh, it's like nothing we'd ever seen anywhere else in the solar system. Those, this stuff here reminds some people of the flat irons. Um, is there wind up here? There is wind because there's an atmosphere, but the atmosphere is so thin. Um, so this stuff can't be we created don't, by wind. We don't think it's wind eroded, though it kind of looks like it is. It may be sun eroded, though it may be that the ice is evaporating in response to the sun. And there are things and like, like penitentes, are these weird structures like sun cups you can get in the mountains on Earth where the but sun is eroding the ice, so it might be something like that. Oh, so it's so cold, the sun can't be doing it. Too. The sun couldn't do it with water ice, but it can do it with methane ice, which is very volatile. So this might be the sun eroding and evaporating methane ice mm -hmm. over millions of years. What is considered to be the temperature? It's about 40 degrees above absolute zero. Uh, it's about minus 350 Fahrenheit. Yeah, wow. It's pretty darn cold. I work in I used to do a cryotherapy with liquid nitrogen, it's about the damn coldest thing. Yeah, so this is about half the temperature of liquid nitrogen in absolute scale. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, but it's also nitrogen, so if you cool down that liquid nitrogen from 77 Kelvin, which is the temperature that it is on Earth, down to 40 Kelvin, then you get something, the same stuff that a lot of this terrain is made out of. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff we're still scratching our heads over. Here's a region that's really uh, weirdly eroded. Um, there are regions that have what look like river channels, though we think they're carved by glaciers. Um, okay, now... Did we bring them? Yeah, I should have done these before. But. We, and we took stereo pictures, so let's see, one, two, three, four on this side. There you go, and form the side. So hopefully that looks kind of 3D there, um, but I'll actually just switch to something more interesting, which is um, some of the Pluto terrain. You should have the red on your left eye. Looks like everyone... Yeah. Oh no, nearly everyone had it right. And once you've done that, you should see the mountains rising up out of this flat plain here. Um, you see all the different levels of eroded terrain in the upper left there, and mountains towards the lower right. Is people seeing that? Mm -hmm. um, 
Here's that jumbled mass of mountains near the edge. Um, you see some really deep canyons, um, sort of over uh, to get there, there in this region here. Um, and a deep crater here. Um, this is Elliot Crater, which is named after an astronomer who used to house it for us, <laughs> but is now but died a few years ago. So you have to be dead to have a crater named after you. That's the rule. Right? Yeah, that's the rule. Um, and then th there's more of those jumbled up iceberg mountains. So from these we can make 3D topographic maps and do really quantitative analysis of the terrain. Um, so it's really a powerful technique. Cool. Yeah. And then looking back at Pluto after the encounter, we um, were got a whole new perspective because we, uh, looking back towards the sun, you see things you don't see looking into the sun. And what we see is the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is very hazy, and you see the haze best when you're looking into the sun, just mm -hmm. as you do on the Earth. And so we saw this enormous deep haze layer above the surface. And if I zoom in on this, this is maybe my favorite picture taken during the encounter. It's, uh, you see that enormous deep atmosphere and the mountains stretching off to the skyline. You see them actually poking up on the skyline in the distance there. It's just a gorgeous... So what's image. the size of Pluto compared to Earth? It's about five times smaller than the Earth. Mm -hmm. um, so the curve is a lot... Uh, a lot bigger. Bigger. Yeah. So this, the scale here is, you know, this might be Colorado Springs down here, and this might be Long's Peak up here, or around, we're, we'd be around here somewhere, and that's about the right scale for this stuff. <clears throat> but of course, yeah, Pluto's so much smaller that it, you see a lot more curvature in that distance. So I was thinking when you said something about those striped lines, is that actually seeing the atmosphere above the yeah. coast? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the haze forms layers like it often does on the Earth, and we don't really understand those yet, but they're... Uh, they're very striking, there's dozens of them. Mm -hmm. um, this is looking at another region here. You can see some of those glaciers flowing down out of the mountains. The, this particular backlit lighting allows you to see this, the flow lines of the glaciers down around here. Um, so yeah, we think this may be a nitrogen cycle, like there is a hydrological cycle on the Earth where the uh, I, nitrogen ice evaporates from this vast sea or glacier, whatever you want to call it, condenses on the highlands and then flows back as glaciers into the sea. And then we think that some of these mountains may be, because the nitrogen ice, which is soft and can flow, but is denser than water ice, actually gets underneath the ice crust and undermines it and breaks up the crust and detaches these enormous blocks which form these floating mountains. So when you're talking about you've got nitrogen, you've got methane, you've got water, mm -hmm. I mean, isn't, aren't the um, atoms in the molecule kind of the core ingredients of what's presumed to be needed for life? If this mm -hmm. was warmed up, you know, you would have... Yeah, uh, these, are all, these are all common uh, uh, chemicals throughout the solar system. So, yeah, I think the ingredients for life are there what you don't have are the temperatures for life right, right, um, right. and you probably don't have enough energy <coughs> for life but right. but yeah the raw materials are pretty common throughout the universe and uh, Pluto is no exception. What is, we're just talking about life on another planet then what what would be the, uh, the, the planet or the an area this is I mean where there life might be in some type of form, uh, or is that why you're going further? Well, further, uh, as we go further up, we're less likely to find life, probably, because it just gets colder and colder, there's less and less energy. Yeah. Uh, but like your, I mentioned Europa, this moon of Jupiter that we took pictures of on our way past Jupiter. Yeah. Um, we're going back there with spacecraft because Europa has a lot of water, uh, but it also has a lot of heat in the interior. Mm -hmm. And so okay. that we're almost sure at this point that that water has been melted. And um, so there is a shell of ice, but then there's vast amounts of liquid water underneath there. So that's a much more promising place for life than Pluto, and that's why we're going back there. That's a place we could go in the future. Right? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Hence our bad things are in this. So, but as you get further and further from our sun, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to go into other places that have the sun. Oh, sure. We, we got to find. Oh, sure. And we have, you know, very intriguing evidence now, as I'm sure you know, around other stars. We know there are planets, some of which are f about the right distance from their suns that uh, they should have liquid water. They're in that Goldilocks, just not too hot, not too cold region. Um, we're finding lots of those now. It's very exciting. We just found one around the nearest star to the Earth. Mm -hmm. But the nearest star to the Earth is maybe 10,000 times further away than Pluto. Uh. So none of our spacecraft that we yet know how to build can go to those kind of distances and explore directly. Like 80,000 years or something like yeah, that? Yeah, something like that. Right. Um, the nearest star? Yeah. Wow. Um, so people are talking about building uh, spacecraft that can go to, across interstellar distances, but they'd have to be a totally different kind of concept. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm sure Elon, that's right. <laughs> oh yeah, those guys are thinking, about thinking pretty hard about that. So what, what, we, what did we learn for our $700 million? What, what did, what, well, how did we add to the knowledge base of humanity? Well, we, I mean, in a sense, in, in a most basic way, we learned more about our neighborhood. You know, we went around the block and oh, there's this really cool <laughs> building over here. And this is part of our home. This is what our town is like. Um, and I think that's of intrinsic value to a lot of people. But beyond that, of course, we're learning about how planets work, what kind of processes heat planets, where they get their energy from, how the atmospheres work. Um, we had a big surprise that Pluto's atmosphere, we thought would be leaking out to space at a pretty significant rate. Um, I, and we learned when we got there, it's actually, it is leaking into space, but a hundred times less fast than we thought it would be. So there's something we really don't understand about how upper atmospheres work, at least in Pluto's case. And who knows, we might learn something that would be important for the Earth's atmosphere, learning some more about the subtleties of how the physics works in upper atmospheres, which might be important for the Earth, but you know, with science you never know what specific thing is going to lead to a specific benefit. But as we you know, expand our knowledge, we, we learn things that can be applied in all kinds of areas that we never could have suspected in the first place. Um, so it's raw knowledge without immediate practical benefit, but so is almost everything else that our m current lives are based on when they were first discovered. Okay. Well, you would also think that just the ability to manipulate spacecraft and vehicles to a place this far away that exactly, you know, you have to get insights into things like, well, uh, if there's an asteroid that's heading in the mm -hmm. wrong direction, oh, sure. here at yeah. some point we'll have the knowledge to maybe yeah. you know, get onto it and kind of nudge it away or something like that, and that could be right. huge. That could right. be huge. Mm -hmm. Can I add one thing? Yeah. Um, the interest by children in science has just been amazing. Mm -hmm. And so this, and there are a lot of women on this team. And so young women too have been really interested. Yeah. They have a large outreach um, program to children. And yeah, yeah. Pluto just has this amazing right. appeal to uh, kids. It's all those comic books, I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's the way to do it. And the whole, you know, there were people on the mission who were really upset when Pluto got demoted <laughs> uh, from being a real planet to being a dwarf planet. But, you know, in a weird way, that just got a lot of people's attention from, on Pluto. And people knew something about Pluto, and it made them all the more interested when we went there. And yeah, the public interest in this, this was just incredible. Um, you know, we uh, got the most, NASA got the most hits on their website that they've ever had for anything from when we, we flew past Pluto. When you were, when you were from uh, Jupiter to Pluto then, how many miles per hour was the spacecraft traveling then around? Well, 40. it's, it slows down as it's climbing up away from the sun. It's always fighting the sun's gravity. So, yeah, it launched at 36,000 miles an hour away from the Earth. And it would have slowed down significantly by the time it reached Jupiter, and then it got a boost from Jupiter right. that speeded it up again to maybe something close to its launch speed, oh, and then it was slowing down again mm -hmm. all the way out. So it's continually varying. And 
So somewhere yeah. between 20 and 30, 30, 20 and 36,000 yeah. miles per hour. I think 40, it was around 40 when it went past. 40,000 miles yeah. an hour. Yeah, that yeah. sounds. And yeah. I think in kilometers per second, so it's 14 right. kilometers per second now, not slowing down very much because of the sun's gravity is so feeble, feeble out there. Um, and that's about 10 miles a second. So 10 miles a second is about 36,000 miles an hour, actually, right. okay. which is pretty close to what we started. Yeah. Right. Well, after all these years, you still think of kilometers as opposed to miles. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's science. Um, it's, like it's, far, it's not, it's not far, it, but you can't take no miles. No, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's not, not so much being British, it's being, because we grew up with miles. Um, it's just, in science, you do nearly everything in metric. It's a lot easier. Yeah. Still thinking of furlongs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> furlongs for Portland. Yeah. For <laughs> Portland. Yeah. Oh, well, this was cool. This is zooming out on that image, and you see the the atmosphere, the glow of the atmosphere all the way around. And if you look on the night side, you can see mountains silhouetted against the Jeez. in the middle of the night, silhouetted against the, that haze. This is a pre-dawn haze on Pluto, and you see a star that's streaked by the motion of the spacecraft in the upper right there. And that haze is blue. This is what the pictures look like. Um, in uh, that's a, okay. That's a weird thing. It, it looks like bright, and then it fades. You mm -hmm. see that? Oh, anyway, <laughs> is the, so we had this beautiful blue ring that we were watching as we departed from Pluto. So that's Pluto. I should move along here. Um, this is the bit of the moon Charon, and this is a single picture of the two in the correct relative positions and and sizes. Um, with our color camera. That's what Sharon looks like up close. It's also a very interesting world. We think that dark pole is actually from Pluto's atmosphere escape, escaping and freezing out at the poles of Sharon during the winter and Sharon. Um, so that's a unique kind of thing. Um, we've used a science fiction fantasy naming scheme on Sharon, a lot of names <laughs> suggested by the public and internet polls, so we've had fun with those. But again, again, again these are still <laughs> Uh, still uh, informal. I bet you the Russians and the Chinese don't like these names. <laughs> well, we these are the ones familiar to us. But we've we when you're naming things, you try and be as inclusive as possible. Okay. Which is so Sputnik Planum is the big region on Pluto. Um, we have a Norge Montes, uh, named after Tenzing Norge, who was the Sherpa who was on the first on top of Everest. So we we do try and be as inclusive as possible in the names. So there are actually some names from other culture, fantasies, names I would not recognize or pronounce. So, but these are the ones that we all know and are familiar with almost. Uh, There's just a close-up on Sharon there. It's, some areas seem to have been, the surface has collapsed and been flooded with, we think, some sort of ammonium water slurry. Um, and then these are the small moons. We didn't get such good pictures of them. They're very small. The, here they are compared to Sharon in size, but we could see they're kind of irregular lumps. And the interesting thing about those is their rotations, or one of the interesting things. This is Pluto and Sharon as a cartoon. They're locked in synchronous rotation, so they always have the same sides facing each other when we expected the other moons to look like that. But the other moons actually look like this, the rotation rates. They're spinning at crazy speeds in crazy directions. Some of them are actually spinning on their sides. And they're not at all forming, following the normal rules of satellite motion. So we're still trying to figure that one out. Uh, mm -hmm. But the fact they're orbiting a double, essentially they're orbiting a double planet instead of a single body probably has something to do with it. They can't settle down into stable rotations. But that was a big surprise. Uh -huh. And obviously it's the surprises from which we learn the most. So now we're, yeah, we're going out beyond Pluto. We're going in, out into the rest of the Kuiper Belt. Pluto's on the inner edge. And one of the, my jobs on the mission has been to help us find an object beyond Pluto that we can actually reach with the spacecraft. Um, the, there are, looks like there are hundreds of thousands of objects out here along our trajectory, but of course in reality they're spread out over enormous distances. And the spacecraft only has enough fuel to change its course just a little bit. So we need to find something that's in a very narrow range, region of space if we want to actually fly up to it close. Um, so we spent years searching with uh, some of the biggest telescopes in the world, and we found lots of objects, just none of them were quite close enough to our trajectory. We could reach them with, with fuel we had. Um, what is the fuel that you use? It's hydrazine, 
which is a pretty common rocket fuel. Um, it's also pretty poisonous stuff. You have to be very careful hand handling it, but it's very efficient. And we have a fuel tank that's maybe about this big, and we've been conserving that store of hydrazine the whole mission and being very careful how we use it because obviously we, there's no filling stations. So um, we had to, the amount of hydrazine we had determined how large a range of uh, space we could get to. Are nuclear batteries sort of considered to be maybe a potential fu fuel of the future? Well, there's electrical power. We have nuclear, we have plutonium provides electrical power. Right. Um, you could use nuclear power for propulsion um, if you have some kind of electric rocket that's powered off that uh, electrical power. And people are talking about that, but they haven't actually got okay. designs working right now. But we can do that. If we put our minds to it, we could do that. And if we ever go back to Pluto with a, to orbit Pluto or something like that, we'd probably use something like a nuclear rocket. And maybe not a nuclear rocket, but a nuclear electric rocket like that. Uh, but that's in the future. Um, I should wrap up, so I'm just going to skip a little bit here. Anyway, to finally find an object that we could reach, we had to use the Hubble telescope, and two years ago we spent, we took a thousand pictures of the sky and the area we were searching with the Hubble telescope, and um, it was it was rather exciting. We this was our last chance to find something beyond Pluto. Um, they told us we needed to find something within like two weeks or they wouldn't give us time for the rest of our project because we wanted so much time. So the pressure was really on us to find something early on and we did. We found enough objects that we could uh, get the rest of our time and complete our survey. We actually found about five objects, but the one we're actually going to we found in one of our earlier pictures and it's this is a blow up of a little piece of one of these mosaics that we uh, images of the sky that we took and this is a blow of a tiny piece of that and that little faint object this is a time lapse of five images moving across that Freya field that is an object that we calculated pretty quickly was right in the direction we were going we could actually reach it with the amount of fuel we had so that was pretty exciting to make that discovery and know we had a, a destination beyond Pluto um, this is gives you some idea of how hard that was. This is a tiny, that little tiny piece of that image and the five frames and the object we're heading for is in the center of the frame. Mm. You can maybe see a little dot that doesn't move as the stars drift past it. Mm -hmm. That is, that's our target and that's the object we're going to visit up close in 2019. Uh, and it, it was discovered by our friend Mark Bowie in, in our office just across the street there in uh, June 2014. So it now has the wonderful name of 2014 MU69. Uh, we're hoping to get a better name for it by the time we get to Pluto. Um, and that's where it is beyond Pluto, where the Earth is way in here. There was Jup our Jupiter flyby, here's Pluto, and here's our rendezvous with MU69 in Jan on January the 1st, 2019. Um, it's a small object, it's probably only 20 miles across or so. Um, but it's a kind of object we've never seen before. It's one of the primordial building blocks of the solar system. And what happens after you get there? We keep on going. Oh, yeah. um, so we have no way of slowing down. So we're over this. We're going much faster than the sun's escape velocity. So we're just going to continue out into space. Um, in fact, my final graphic. This is what it might look like. Um, oh, I have to update this because it was approved by NASA last summer. <laughs> um, this was obviously I'm reusing old presentations um, and then we just continue into interstell interstellar space we can probably talk to the spacecraft for another 20 years or so and uh, then it will we won't have enough power to talk to it anymore and it will just continue out on its own <laughs> so that's where we're going and maybe I can come back and tell you what it was what MU69 is like when we get there so, so there's a lot of talk about Planet Nine, is that what they're calling it? Yeah. I was going to ask that uh, question. <laughs> so let's, let's um, there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Planet, let me come and have my dessert. Talk from here. Um, so Planet Nine is a rather obnoxious name for Pluto files for um, a guy who deduced from the orbits of other objects that are out in the Kuiper Belt. Um, there are, some of these objects go way out further 
a thousand times further from the sun than we are. Oops. And um, they seem to be avoiding one part of the sky when you project out their orbits. They're all clustered on one side, and one possible explanation for that may be that there's some heavy object with a lot of gravity that's actually on the other side of the solar system in a eccentric orbit that is clearing out that part of the solar system. And so um, it's all theory at the moment. It's just based on the orbits of these other objects we do know, which are very small. But there's stuff starting to come together that it maybe is, is actually going to be a um, evidence for it. And it might actually be, it's very far out, but it would be bigger than the Earth. Um, and it might be bright enough that we can see it with our telescopes ser searching from the Earth. So as soon as we've narrowed down the region a bit better, people will be looking very hard for it. Um, there was an idea of this meeting I was just at a couple of weeks ago that there's a mystery in the solar system that the sun, the sun spins and the axis of the sun is tilted about five degrees from the plane where all the planets are orbiting, which is a little hard to explain. Um, but if you add in the possible gravitational influence on this object way out there, because it's so far out, it, it sort of affects the balance of the solar system, could explain that offset there. So um, that's a, um, a possible um, little extra bit of evidence that this might be real, but it's, it's early days yet. But it's such an exciting field, there's just new stuff coming up all the time. And like so this, this is all work, what do you do for fun? <laughs> <laughs> More work, I don't know. <laughs>